Members, you're very welcome to this morning's uh, infrastructure committee meeting. I um, advise you to maintain social distancing throughout the meeting. Um, today's committee will consider a ministerial briefing from, on COVID-19 update and current issues, and also a consideration of subordinate legislation. We don't have any apologies, as we have a full house again this morning. I have nothing to report from the Chairman's business. Moving then to draft minutes at page six of your pack uh, from the 1st of July. If members are content. Great. 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 Thank you. Moving then to matters arising at page uh, 14. Again, it was, that's from the, the meeting of the 1st of July. Do members have any queries, concerns, issues? Proceed with those? No? Okay. Thank you. Moving then to page 19. And that's a great detailing outstanding correspondence. Again, if members have any comments to make, I think we're reasonably on, well on top of um, responses coming through, so which is good, and I hope that, that continues. Okay. Um, there, our next item will then be the ministerial briefing, um, and it's on COVID-19 update and current issues. There are briefing papers, um, additional papers on page 23, which is briefing papers from the port, and the hand sergeant will also go forward to the meeting. Uh, the minister has indicated that she has an hour with us today, so we don't have a, a great deal of time, so members are, are mindful of that, and I'm assuming that everyone will want to ask her some questions. Can we welcome the Minister for Infrastructure, Nicola Mallon, and the Permanent Secretary for the Department, Katrina Godfrey. You're both very welcome um, this morning. Thank you for coming um, to be with us. And obviously, this is um, this was quite quite useful to have this discussion, given the fact that we're moving into the recess period as well. It was an opportunity really to um, get a, a sense of where the department is before we move through that, that period. Um, if you don't mind, just given the fact that there is short period of time that we maybe we just go straight to questions. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, because I'm sure a lot of what will be asked will probably be in yep. uh, will be will be in your briefing anyway and we've received um, the paper in advance, um, which obviously outlines some of the challenges that, that are facing the department yep. as we move on. So very aware um, of the publicised financial difficulties that TransLink have. Um, and obviously the company was a beneficiary of the monitoring round um, the, and we were also aware obviously the finance minister has given a commitment to public transport which I think we, we can all welcome um, but can you perhaps give the committee an updated version uh, an updated position just in relation to the financial situation of TransLink and also the difficulties that are now facing Northern Ireland water which is very troubling um, and obviously what we're going to be looking at in order to try to resolve those issues. Yep, sure. Thank you very Thank much, you. Chair. Um, on the issue of um, public transport, um, yes, you're correct that the executive has gave a commitment to ensure the viability uh, of TransLink. That's in recognition of the fact that we all believe that we should have a publicly owned public transport network where routes are based on need uh, and not profit. Um, I have been given an additional allocation uh, in June monitoring um, for TransLink, which is very welcomed. It still, still does leave a, a shortfall. Um, and I will work with executive colleagues um, on that. Um, as we move through the easements, we are seeing marginal increases in the number of passengers. So we are hoping to see an uplift in terms of revenue. But TransLink and Northern Ireland Water, like many of the businesses and industries right across the north, have hugely struggled as a result of dramatic losses in income, a situation none of us could ever uh, have foretold. On the issue of Northern Ireland Water, it is, it is critical, Chair. Um, I was given an allocation in June monitoring uh, of 5.5 million that falls uh, considerably short of what is required. Northern Ireland Water has seen a dramatic reduction uh, in income. Um, uh, businesses haven't been open and domestic use of water has, has significantly increased as people are at home, but obviously following the advice in terms of hand washing. So I've made executive colleagues uh, aware uh, of the information, both at a ministerial level and then also uh, my permanent secretary has been in correspondence with her counterpart in the Department um, of Finance. And I think it's really critical for Northern Ireland Water. We have an immediate pressing problem in terms of the income uh, deficit. So that's standing over 30 million at present. 
But if we're serious about economic recovery, then investment in water and wastewater infrastructure is key. Uh, the phrase no, cranes, or, no drains, no cranes um, is not just a soundbite, it's, it's an actual fact. And so uh, as we move to secure our economic recovery from COVID, we will have to invest in our critical public services. And for me, real critical service here is our water and our wastewater infrastructure. As you will know, Chair, there are around 100 locations in Northern Ireland now that are at or almost at maximum capacity. That's a huge inhibitor in terms of building homes, uh, building factories and growing our economy. Uh, so I will continue to work with the executive and with the committee to secure the funds so that we can move forward comfortably. And obviously we, we've been having these discussions now for a considerable length of time because the issues in relation to infrastructure investment in Northern Ireland water has been well rehearsed. Um, and obviously the issues with regards to COVID and the pressures associated with that then have, have added to the challenge of that. Um, just with regards to sort of the, the immediate issue, um, what, what's that looking like? The immediate issue is, is extremely serious, um, and I don't say that uh, lightly. Um, I have expressed concern that the allocation that was given is only 5.5 million. Um, we have provided multiple pieces of evidence. I do intend to submit a further paper to the executive, uh, and I think that's important as part of our discussions around the COVID recovery. So I'm hoping that when I submit an additional paper that we could see additional funds, hopefully, uh, coming across for that specific purpose. Obviously, whenever we're looking at public transport, we see buses on the, on the roads, we see the trains and so on. People don't really see the infrastructure associated with water. Um, so what would be the immediate impact? Or would, um, the, any individual in Northern Ireland actually see any substantial difference in, in what yeah, well, in the shortfall and yeah, what the impact will, will that be? You're absolutely right. Um, we take for granted that we turn on our tap every morning and we get access to clean, safe drinking water. And we get showered, we get bath, we bath our children, and we then flush the toilet and our, our water is taken away and safely treated, which has huge environmental and public health um, consequences. If we don't invest in our infrastructure, in our wastewater infrastructure, in our water infrastructure, then the housing waiting list will continue to grow. Uh, businesses will continue to say that they are, they are, it is difficult to draw down investment because you don't have the capacity to build. It's just not myself as the infrastructure minister saying that. We have um, the Chamber of Commerce, the Institute of Directors, all of the umbrella groups that represent businesses um, in Northern Ireland are very clear. I can pass you over to the Permanent Secretary, who has been detailing a lot about the, the, the consequences if we don't secure this funding. Yeah, thank you, Minister. And Chair, just to add that I've been in the regular correspondence, our con conversation with the, the Chair and the Senior Committee on I Water. Um, at the moment, they do have a very significant funding gap. Um, I have asked them to set out for us exactly what the consequences of that gap are so that in bringing her paper to the executive, the minister will be able to articulate both the short term and the long term consequences. It's worth saying as well, Chair, that um, NI Water, as well as being a non departmental public body which has to live within the budgets allocated, is also a regulated utility, and the regulator has very significant concerns as well. The figures that NI Water provide have a triple lock almost of assurance because we have the um, requirements of public expenditure, we have the requirements of company directorship which are stretching and, and put very significant demands on the board and we also have the scrutiny of, a, of an independent regulator so I'm very confident that the needs expressed by NI Water can be backed up by anybody and are being backed up by the regulator as things that are necessary to happen and you don't have a £30 million hole in your budget at this point in the financial year without there being consequences. So for us, it's working out what they are, making sure that we have the information for the Minister to be able to describe them in the short term, and then, as the Minister says, having the conversation with the Executive about is this really what we intend to happen. And when do you anticipate having that information? I would expect to have it very shortly from NI Water and then we'll be able to scrutinise it ourselves and review it if needs be. We'll have conversations with the regulator but um, from my conversations with the company we will have to think very carefully along with them as to you know, what that sort of hole in funding means. 
the, the executive um, will continue to meet right throughout um, August, uh, so there is time. So I would be keen to get that paper submitted. I, I don't think that we can have a comprehensive or realistic discussion about economic recovery if we do not have a serious discussion around water and wastewater infrastructure. Not to say that no, it is it is worrying. Um, on the 10th of June, um, you made a statement outlining the allocations which you intended to make, which was was very welcome. Um, but there was a lack of detail, and obviously you've received a tsunami of questions from um, representatives, including myself, in relation to what that would actually mean, because obviously you have four million pounds for park and ride, um, two million for 100 schools, rural schools particularly, uh, um, in relation to the 20 mile an hour sign, and a multitude of, of other budget lines have been announced. When will you be in a position to give more detail around those? Okay, so on the um, four million pounds of the park and ride, we're currently going through the list because the key thing is deliverability. We're factoring in issues like demand. So I would hope um, that I would be in a position to be able to announce the park and ride schemes that we're going to progress this financial year. Uh, I would hope to do that very shortly. Uh, in respect of the, um, the money that has been set aside for the Greenways, we've written out to all of the councils. Uh, we've asked them to you know, advance the proposals that we have. I'm very keen to see that happen on the ground. We're working in partnership, so again, proactively going to the councils to say, what proposals have you? What <coughs> stage are they at? How can we help you? In relation to the £2 million for the 100, roughly, schools for 20 miles per hour, and we have received a huge influx, as you would imagine, from uh, new schools wanting to be part of the scheme. So I'm very clear that we have to fairly assess all. Uh, we are using the matrix and the assessment that was already in place, um, but what we have to do is to run that through the, the new request as well. Um, but I'm very clear with officials that that needs to happen at pace. We are hoping to see the schools back um, in September time. And also, I'm very clear that I want to see significant progress and delivery on this within this financial year. And I'm conscious that we are moving quickly through this financial year. So again, once we have the assessments fairly completed, I would hope to be in a position very soon to be able to announce a number of the schools that will benefit from this scheme in this financial year. And I'm also keen to see it expanded um, in the additional years after that as well. The £20 million wider blue-green fund, we have been meeting with the range of stakeholders uh, around co-design. Um, I'm keen it has to be partnership. Um, I want to provide the drive for this, but I cannot provide the local detail. Uh, it's local councils and businesses and communities that know what will work best um, in their areas. So we're doing that piece of engagement uh, very quickly. But I'm also clear I want to see an element of flexibility in this as well. Um, and I'm also keen to work with other government departments. The Minister for Communities, for example, has written to executive colleagues about a potential revitalisation fund around town centres and city centres. I think that active travel has a key role to play in that. So I'm looking to see how we can contribute in terms of the work that we're doing. And I think that is probably the best approach. So where processes are being put in place and I would hope to be very shortly in a position where I can announce the specific projects that we're going to be advancing as part of this Blue Green, <coughs> Green Recovery Fund. Okay, no, thank you, appreciate that. And, and no doubt other colleagues will ask for, ask for more detail around some of those other um, budget lines. Um, obviously, the decision has obviously been taken now with regards to mandatory face covering <coughs> on, um, on public transport. And, and, and I, I certainly welcome that, and, and I appreciate there will be a wide range of opinion um, about the, the use of, of face coverings. Can I just ask you whether or not this is um, a substitute or certainly a mitigating measure rather than social distancing on transport? Absolutely not. Um, we're very clear that the strongest way of protecting yourself and others from this virus is through um, good respiratory hygiene and washing uh, and social distancing. The move to mandatory face coverings uh, comes um, from a number of considerations. Uh, the first is that the executive did recommend that people wear face coverings in areas um, where they couldn't maintain social distancing, and we've seen a very, very low uptake in that. Uh, as we have progressed through this pandemic, uh, the evidence has increased that there are wider societal benefits to the wearing of face coverings in enclosed spaces. We've seen dramatic increases in the numbers in terms of compliance in Scotland and England and in the South where they have made this uh, move. Um, so I think that it's an important step forward in terms of wider uh, confidence in terms of getting people back onto public transport, but also an important step in terms of protecting other passengers. I've met with the Chief Scientific Advisor a couple of times on this um, as we worked this proposal up, uh, and he was very clear that one of the groups that would benefit most from this will be those who are currently shielding, 
and they are asked to shield until the end of July. But that cohort is quite highly dependent on the use of public transport. Uh, and so the use of face coverings on public transport, embedding that in for a few weeks before their shielding period ends, I think will give them a sense of reassurance um, as well. So I suppose the message is we are doing this to keep other passengers safe. We're asking people to comply with it. It's a light touch. Uh, enforcement approach, and we have seen that that has worked in other places. And I have every confidence that in Northern Ireland, people will rally around and do this to keep each other safe. Okay. But obviously, there's, there are no masks for under 13-year-olds, and I'm kind of conscious that we're moving then to September. Um, obviously, the education minister is very keen to have uh, all pupils returned to school, um, obviously subject to to the medical advice. But we're moving in in that direction. Um, I'm mindful of previous discussions that we had around what the capacity would look like on, on transport. So if it's two metres, it will be 15 per cent. One metre could be around about 25 per cent. Now, there are 84,000 pupils who have um, bus passes. You know, how is this going to be addressed? Okay, so um, I worked closely with the Education Minister when I was devising um, these proposals around face coverings. Um, the Education Minister had a concern um, about school children, and so children, as you rightly say, Chair, from the ages of 13 and under are exempt, but school transport is exempt under the proposals that I got agreed at the Executive. Uh, in public transport, we keep the issue of social distancing under constant review, but we do so in line with the public health advice and the Executive's consideration and position on the, on the issue. Um, so I, I would imagine that as the executive keeps this under review, if the executive were moved to a position uh, and change its position, its current position on social distancing, then we would obviously follow suit on public transport. Okay. Because I think we were all we're all very aware that it'll be very difficult um, to keep um, young people separate, particularly if they're if they're in playgrounds and so on. Then all of a sudden, whenever they're going to get the bus, then they're they're having to. to There's certainly the pragmatic. Um, argument in favour, but also the scientific evidence. Uh, we picked the age 13 in our um, consultations with the chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer uh, because they were saying that from that age and down, the level of transmission is not as high a risk uh, as older you know, people and, and teenagers. So it was in conjunction with the scientific and the medical advice and listening to the concerns, obviously, of ministerial colleagues, including Minister Weir, that we arrived at the position that we have in respect of 13-year-olds in school transport. Okay, thank you. That was very, very helpful. Um, Deputy Chairman, Mr. Eldridge. Thanks, thanks, Chair. And I just want to move then to some of the uh, capital issues, and specifically the York Street interchange. Uh, your communication with us. You mentioned some of the other. Uh, capital schemes there, uh, A5, A6, Transport Hub and the Londonderry Korean Rail Line. But it's been the same with some of the departmental officials coming forward as well with their report. It does seem that the York Street interchange is but it's concerning as it's not been mentioned very much, to be honest. And we're ten months down the road from I think the judicial decision. And we're just wondering where, where it all sits at the moment. There's concern, obviously, from elected representatives and members of the public who were that as a, a jewel in the crown capital scheme, you know? Um, I, I can assure you that um, I remain committed to York Street Interchange. I, I give that commitment on the floor and in assembly questions, I think, to Mr Beggs. Um, what, what I am doing with York Street Interchange is I have asked officials to look at different options. It's not about halting it or not progressing it. It's about taking a very quick period just to take stock to make sure that it is fit for purpose and absolutely the right scheme because it's huge sums of money. But I recognise the importance of it. Um, it's, a, it's a commitment, a new decade, new approach. I also use it, uh, so I'm very well aware of the traffic congestion and I also represent the community that lives beside it. So I'm well aware of the respiratory difficulties that are caused by the fact that cars are um, backed up um, and with the pollution that comes with it. So I want to reassure the committee that I am fully committed to it. What I have done is I have said that I want to take a very, very quick pause just to make sure that we're doing absolutely the right thing. Um, and I hope to be able to bring clarity on that very soon. That pause and review seems to have been taken and going on now for 10 months. And that, I think, is a concern. And see, that's the information that has been given to us from previous visits by departmental officials. Okay. Uh, I, I take on board what you're saying from yourself here today. but. There is a concern out there that we're, we're sort of slowed way down on the project, you know. Well, I can maybe bring in the Permanent Secretary because I'm not aware of what previous officials have said or what has occurred before I took up post. But I do want to assure you that I'm committed to it. I just think it's huge sums of money. Um, and I think we absolutely have to make sure that we get, get it right. 
Yeah, just to just pick up on that point, um, the Minister has made clear her, her commitment to her officials and that there is no doubt about that. In terms of the period before ministers took up post, one of the challenges we certainly had was um, in trying to devise a procurement strategy in the absence of ministerial direction. So prior to ministers arriving, the only um, direction I would have had would have been in relation to the design phase only, and I wouldn't have been able to um, take forward a proposal for procurement that looked at the scheme in the round. So um, one of the key issues for us actually was making sure we had the direction of returning ministers and, and a clear sense of where to go. Um, and I think if we had taken a decision in the absence of ministers, that would have been really difficult for us. Um, we could have taken the wrong decision. We could have taken a decision that might have been challenged. So. It was one of those ones that there's no easy way around it. We are better with clear ministerial direction um, in terms of how to take it forward, but there is no doubt in our minds around, you know, just it, it seems being taken slipped, forward, yeah. and the minister's made her commitment very clear. It just seems to have slipped off briefing notes and communications, and since we've come back here, really, you know. And I guess one of the issues there is, is yeah, it's, it's, it was never designated as an executive flagship. Um, so when we talk about flagships, people maybe expect to hear it mentioned and, and we stick rigidly to the, <laughs> to the list. But the Minister's commitment is clear. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, road safety, I know from very early on, I've been asking about the budget. <coughs> there's 700,000 just in the road safety budget. Um, appreciate your attempts to get things moving along in the act of travel and cycling walking champion appointed and various things like that and the opportunity maybe for a blue fund a blue green fund unfortunately in recent times there seems to have been a lot more accidents around the the province uh, not not all fatalities but certainly some serious injuries and whatnot and stuff there does seem to be some need to be some work done on road safety but we do seem to be constrained by a very low budget on that Front, you yeah. um, you're absolutely right that we have seen an increase um, during lockdown of the number of accidents and I've been engaged and I've actually met with the Chief Constable on a number of occasions out of concern on this and other issues um, and uh, drink driving has been a factor. Um, we, I have been trying to progress um, through the Home Office the procurement of the uh, breathalysers that would allow us to be more robust on this and there has been slippage on that and I know the Chief Constable has been trying to use whatever influence he can along with myself to see can we get progress on that. Um, you will be aware as well that I'm trying to take action in respect of mobile phone use while driving which is a, a phenomenon it's hugely increasing you only have to be walking or in your car to witness it so hoping to move forward legislation to tackle that. Um, the 20 miles per hour around the schools should also help uh, in terms of trying to enhance road safety, particularly for parents and children walking to and from school. And then obviously the road safety strategy runs out at the end of this year. So officials are preparing proposals um, for me to be able to take that forward. I would hope again to be in a position around the autumn time to be bringing you uh, some ideas and some proposals on that. One of the areas that's not good news, to be honest, very concerning yet. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr Buchanan. Okay, thank you. And thank the Minister and Catherine for your update so far. Just want to touch on your refer to live issues here in your paper on uh, Dalrady and Goldmine. Where's that at now and what's the sort of the position of that generally? Sure. Um, so you'll be aware that I have announced that I intend to call a public inquiry. Um, this is a hugely complex and controversial application. We've received over 36,000. Um, objections to it uh, and so uh, in considering it uh, in the round I have decided that a public inquiry is the optimum avenue in terms of independently assessing the views of local communities and stakeholders and government departments and also to robustly scrutinise the information that comes forward. Um, we are awaiting additional um, information uh, from the applicant, um, but once I'm satisfied that all of the necessary detail and consultative responses have been provided, I will move to call the public inquiry then, and I think that that uh, is important uh, in terms of providing and considering fully the information in terms of this very, very significant application. And where do you see that being, or I presume it's guided by this additional information? Yeah, so I'm not in a position now to be able to definitively say when, but what I can say is that once we're satisfied that we've received all of the necessary detail and the consultee responses, then I will be moving uh, towards the public inquiry then. Yeah. 
see the mandatory face coverings, what, yeah. what position does that put drivers in <coughs> to try and police that, for a better word? What, what's the, the instruction to drivers? Because that can be troublesome, yeah, problematic, course. should I say. Yeah, um, and I engage um, extensively with the unions on this to try and get it right, and I've been watching very closely what they're doing in other places. Translink has a protocol in place with the PSNI, um, and we would only envisage that protocol being evoked if, for example, a passenger gets on, um, refuses to wear a face covering, refuses to explain, becomes extremely aggressive and hostile. Uh, then the, the driver would have the option of calling the PSNI. The PSNI would come on board, then they have the option of issuing the fixed penalty notice under the coronavirus regulations. Similar to the situation that would arise if someone becomes aggressive or under the influence of alcohol and drugs on our buses or, or trains. Um, but we are taking very much a light touch enforcement. What we have seen is that education and engagement, personal responsibility, is a way that this actually works in practice. Um, and what I've been very clear on is that uh, I do not want anyone with a physical or a mental or a communicative disability having to produce a letter or a detailed explanation or a card to justify why they're not wearing a face covering. Now, I understand that this will work. It's built on responsibility and respect. We can't absolutely police this situation, um, you know, and it's not. I know that some, you know, First Minister had a concern around the criminalisation of people. That is absolutely not the intention uh, of this. Uh, so this will work if everybody works together, takes it seriously and shows respect. And that is what has happened in England. It's happened in Scotland and it's happening in the South as well. OK, and then final question, obviously, I presume you had a good night's sleep from, from yesterday's motion regarding the, the, the sectors we discussed. What commitment are you giving us to communicate with all of, either your department or all the departments to support taxi haulage and bus industry and, and uh, you know, the whole tourism sector, the, the, the bus industry is, is struggling. There's no buses on the road. I met with the representatives the other day from those, and those guys are putting out big money each week. And I'm just talking specifically in the bus sector. Okay. What commitment are you giving here today to work with them in conjunction with your other colleagues, come up with a package for them? Okay. Well, you know, I have to say that I, I, I was a bit disappointed yesterday that the committee in full, you know, could, could, felt that it couldn't support the amendment about the executive because it is very much a cross cut issue, uh, and that was recognised by a number of speakers yesterday. I have been engaging with the, the, the sectors, also um, met, I think it was maybe a fortnight ago, with Karen McGill. Um, in respect of the bus tour operators, and you'll know that they are a specific focus of the work stream around the tourism recovery of the Department for Economy. Um, as I also outlined yesterday, the Minister for the Economy has brought forward to the Executive um, a range of options in terms of the underspend currently within her department for hardship funds, but also looking to the future about what we should do. I expressed my view in <coughs> that I felt that we should be extending support to those who have fallen through the cracks of current schemes that are on offer. In addition to expressing my written support for that, I've also said to the Economy Minister in writing that I would be supportive of a bid to the funds that are held centrally, um, if required, in order to get help to those in the haulage industry, those in the taxi industry, those who are in, working in pr as private tour operators um, and driving instructors as well who haven't been able to get any assistance so far. I will continue to make those representations. I understand that that paper is due to come back again for further consideration, and that will remain my position in terms of my support in getting help to those who haven't been able to avail of the schemes to date. I will also do what I can to remain in close contact with the industries. Uh, if they have any regulatory difficulties, I'm keen to try to resolve those, um, but also to work with executive colleagues as well to make sure that we can get the wide range of support, whether it's regulatory, whether it's financial, uh, whether it's guidance, all of that, um, to get those two the industries working together as a collective executive. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and I could have welcomed Minister. Uh, just, I, I welcome the comments in relation to the road safety, and I look forward to the working with us in terms of the new strategy. We've seen, obviously, there was double the deaths in May compared to last year, and that, that certainly is, is tragic and something we need to look at and something we need to learn from. But I have three uh, key points now, Minister. The government is formed in the south. In terms of those cross-border projects like the Narrow Water Bridge, the Ulster Canal and the F5, what preparations have you made or is there any discussion now in terms of the North-South Ministerial Council? That, that's one question. I'll, I'll give you the three questions you can answer. The Road Recovery Fund, which is the, the yep. rear road, I mean, they said you had £10 million this year. There was was it £12 million last year or no. is, is, much, is it much this year? Just, yeah. just not that there is any difference between... Um, 
this year and last year because I think that's a good programme to roll out, to be honest. And, and it's helping out there, although I have to say some of the rural roads may need more, some of the foundations of those roads are, are maybe need looked at as well. But um, And finally, uh, we had a meeting with the chair of the CBI, I think, at the end of May, and they were talking about the independent advisory body that might be able to support in terms of infrastructure. Just we update on some of that. That's the okay. question. Okay. Uh, so in terms of engagement with the counterpart in the south, um, we've just seen the recent formation um, of the government. Um, I'm due to meet with Eamon Ryan, my ministerial counterpart in the south, to talk about all island connectivity, the opportunities from that, to also talk about the cross-border projects. And then obviously, I think that there's huge cooperation and potential for cooperation around the kind of active travel agenda on the island, but also climate action. Um, I understand as well that um, the Taoiseach is due to visit uh, and will be keen and will be meeting. Uh, along with ministerial counterparts, I'm sure, uh, to discuss the opportunities and the Irish government's commitment to a number of the projects that are referenced in New Decade New Approach. Um, I'm very, very keen to get attend in the North South Ministerial Council meeting. Um, six months in post, and we haven't been able to attend any such meetings so far, but keen to get that back on track. I would also just make the point that through this, this pandemic, you also have to, I think, look at opportunities and things that you have learnt and new ways of working. One of the most beneficial engagements that I have had throughout this um, crisis has been with my counterparts in Scotland and Wales, I have to say, and that's the kind of engagement I would like to keep going along uh, with my counterpart in the South. And I've also had very good engagement um, with ministers within the Department for Transport as well. So I would like to keep that cross-island cooperation and engagement going, even from an information sharing point of view, it's hugely beneficial. Uh, on the roads recovery, um, you'll be aware in my budget that I allocated 75 million uh, for roads. That's the resurfacing and, and trying to address the potholes because I firmly believe you have to get the basics right. That's why I've also allocated um, an increase in funding for street lighting, which should see a 12-month repair programme for street lighting. So I just think it's unacceptable for communities to be literally left in the dark. And if we're not doing the basics right, how can they have any faith that we will get new things and ambitious things right? On the road recovery fund within the 75 million, I have allocated 12 million to a general roads recovery, but within that, 10 million is for rural roads. I think that's very important in terms of addressing regional um, imbalance. And then in terms of your final point, uh, this was actually an issue that I discussed when I attended a webinar, I think that's what they're called now, mm -hmm. um, with uh, CBI and IBEC. It was an all-island basis, and I fielded a number of questions from businesses right across the island. That was an issue that, that came up, uh, and I know it's an issue that Mr Moore ha has written to me on as well. Uh, so it's something that I am actively considering. I think that we need to have a longer-term strategic approach to our in in infrastructure planning and investment and I think that having a more independent forum to try to inform the Minister for Infrastructure but also the executive because you're talking about energy and a wide range of issues I think would be hugely beneficial so I'm just taking time to listen to a number of stakeholders on it and starting to formulate my own views on it to try and see what the options might be for taking something like that forward. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Well, thank you, um, and join others in welcoming the Minister and uh, Permanent Secretary to the meeting. Um, Minister, you made an announcement yesterday around theory tests. I wonder, could you give us a wee bit more detail on, on how that would work? And I want to say, I'm sure, uh, along with others, I'd welcome, welcome that. Um, and also, I just wonder, um, we have received a lot of representation from driving instructors around, uh, I mean, and some of them have started back to work, but what guidance? Uh, have you been given by the executive office uh, to give to those? And I suppose that then probably leads on to, in terms of driving examiners, you know, how much of that uh, will allow th th uh, those tests to be up and running again. And if I may also um, ask a bit about pavement parking, other areas have brought in fines. You know, we talked about schools, and Mr. Boyle and others talked about road safety. And I remember fighting very hard to get curb, you know. But past put beside some of my schools, so parents could walk, and now other parents are driving and parking on the footpath. So I don't know what your thoughts are in relation to that. And I know, uh, as a policing board member, we had a recent presentation by Road Safety um, Branch, and uh, uh, in relation to the new strategy, and one was around cyclists, you know, and the number of um, cycle injuries. But we found out other jurisdictions actually have enforcement opportunities in other jurisdictions that they can um, find cyclists for careless driving. 
might not be popular with some, but be popular with others. But nonetheless, it, it, it is a, a causation uh, and some of the accidents. That, that's what we are hearing uh, from the, the police in, in relation uh, to that. And um, uh, if Boris Johnson lives up to his promise of turbocharging the economy and infrastructure, you know, will we have Barnet consequentials? And if so, you know, will we be in a position to be able to spend, um, particularly west of the Ban and particularly Armagh, Banbridge and Oman and Fermanagh direction? Because uh, there, uh, we, we have a large manufacturing base, huge haulage companies in North South, and yet we don't have any real network worth talking about. And we, we have very little dual carriageway across that whole region. So thank you. Okay. <laughs> Number of questions in there. Um, forgive me if I overlook any. Beginning with the, the latter, um, yes, um, in New Decade New Approach, there was clear references to turbocharging um, infrastructure. Um, the Prime Minister, on a number of occasions, has talked about the importance of investing in infrastructure and has been more explicit in, in his words as a result of COVID-19. And I think what we're seeing in countries right across the world is that recognising that investment in infrastructure is key to economic recovery and getting through COVID. So, you know, I am very firmly of the view that the British government needs to live up to its commitments in terms of turbocharging infrastructure here in Northern Ireland. I'm very keen to work with him. Uh, I haven't had time to scrutinise uh, the statement um, that's going to be coming forward today to see if there are any Barna consequentials for infrastructure. It doesn't seem as if that might be the case. We live in hope. Uh, but we live in hope. <laughs> um, we'll continue to make the case. On the issue of the um, pavement parking, this is an issue I'm very much aware of. Um, as a department, I've been clear we need to be um, engaging closely with MTAC, for example, and with disability groups. And it's a huge issue for people with mobility and visual impairment difficulties trying to navigate our pavements. I suppose the added uh, issue now is that we have a number of businesses who, for the need to socially distance, have to now acquire some pavement space. Um, so I've been very clear with councils that while I want to see a very flexible and pragmatic approach in terms of supporting those businesses, we need to be working with disability groups to understand the implications for and to prevent further disruption or harm being caused to those with visual impairments or mobility issues. So you know it's something that I'm very mindful of. Um, on the issue of um, cyclists and careless cycling, we have seen a huge increase in cycling. I think it's great. Members will know that I'm very proactively pushing that agenda. But this is an issue. And as you have engaged with the issue on the policing board, it has also been an issue that I've been discussing with the Chief Constable. And I know that the PS and I do have some concerns around that. And what I've said that, you know, as my officials can work with the PS and I to see how we can look to tackle that in a sensible and fair way. In respect of the um, driving examiners and driving instructors, yes, the driving instructors were never actually specified in the regulations from executive office and there then transpired that they could have continued working technically um, throughout the COVID crisis. Uh, but obviously they work in a high risk environment. The engagement that my department has had with driving instructors is we have been um, signposting them to the guidance that's available and there's significant amount of guidance, guidance that has been produced by the industry itself. I've also asked executive office, because I think this would be helpful for MLAs, businesses and members of the public, to collate um, uh, a number of the sectors that we're, we're, we're asking to open and clearly signposting them in one stop shop, if you like, where they can obtain the relevant guidance for their industry um, and their sector. On the driving exam and uh, practical driving tests to fall within my department, um, we recognise that that has a knock-on effect for driving instructors. And so we're working very closely with the unions and with staff to carry out risk assessments to ensure that we can get practical driving tests up and running as quickly and safely as possible. You will know from the statement that I made on DVA resumption of services that we commenced the testing for motorcyclists on Monday. Uh, commenced the theory testing on um, Monday as well. The 20th of July, we will move to the MOT testing of a number of priority vehicles that have not been able to avail of TECs. And so the last bit of the puzzle that we have to work out is the um, issue of cars, and we're, we're working on that, just to reassure you. In recognising that I can't give a definitive date for the resumption of practical um, driving tests for cars, I have, as you have said, announced that I'll be bringing forward legislative change to see an extension to the validity of the theory test certificates. I'm very mindful that a number of learner drivers you know, passed their test in between March and now. 
you know, their, their certificate may have expired, so I don't want them to be further inconvenienced. So that regulation will be brought forward in September and applied retrospectively. So essentially what it means is that if you have passed your theory test for your car, but it expires between the 1st of March um, and October, you will have that extended for that period. If you're a motorcyclist and you pass the theory test, then that will be um, extended for a six month period as well. And so that will create some breathing space so that we can get the, the practical tests up and running. But importantly for me, it means it's minimising further any disruption to our learner drivers. Yeah, thank you. That was everything. Sounds. Uh, thank you. Thank you both for, for being here. And, uh, Minister, I'm not going to go on because I've talked to some of your officials about the A2 Bunk Cranley Road, so I'm going to pick that up on them. The A5 has already been mentioned, and I appreciate the fact that you've been meeting with the, um, the Irish Government on that and the North South Ministerial Council. I think it's worth reminding them what they committed to it and then what they're actually saying they're going to give now, so they need that uplift back up and running. Um, Strathoyle is the Greenway, so I'm going to be working with Council to make sure that that is on your desk. But two issues I would like to uh, talk to you about and ask you about, and one is Brexit. And it's in relation to the common framework. You will hear from Scotland today that they are rejecting the enforcement, as they call of the common framework, by the British government onto them. And there's a number of issues in this common framework, and I know some of your colleagues have mentioned Brexit in terms of the executive needing to get out a message. But I'm wondering what, you, what your views are. Driving hours, uh, aviation regulations, water quality, flood risk management, and rail passengers' rights. They are a number of the common frameworks. There are, um, I think, somewhere in the region of 42 of these common frameworks. But they're the ones that I can identify that relate to, to your department. So if you could give us an update on that. And then the second one is in relation to rail. Um, I know we've had a number of exchanges with regards to that. The passenger numbers in Derry have increased year on year, and if you take 2018-2019, uh, really far exceeded what Translink said it was going to do. Three million people use that rail, even though the, the line leaves much to be improved, as you know. I know that you have issued the feasibility study for the Phase 3. And uh, when we look at rail connectivity, particularly uh, the opportunity which you're very keen on of tackling carbon emissions, um, I think the short term, the feasibility study is to get a sense about the time frame for that. But I think it's worth noting when you talk about tackling regional inequalities, and that's my spokesperson, Joel, for the party, Sinn Féin, and I know you're quite committed to that. Um, east of the band, there are 51 train stations. West of the band, there are three. So that just in terms now, it's not that I'm looking for any more railway stations, by the way, in terms of that's not the argument. It could be part of what I'm saying, but um, I'm really looking at uh, an improvement on the line. So, uh, and even though you don't have the time, Scotland, you talked about your engagement with Scotland. When you look at Scotland, what they did, and I'm sure you're engaging with your own people in that, uh, looking at Ebbington to the Scottish border, they, lo they opened up that, and that was great success. And I say this now in the context of the, of the dairy line. So the time scale, the short term strategies, I know you would be involved in, longer term ones that you may not be able to complete. Um, but what you might be able to do is to start the ball rolling on them. So I would like to, to know if you would consider exploring maybe a feasibility study, looking at Derry, Letter County, Sligo, uh, lines there, um, looking at Derry, Straban, um, Porta Down onto Dublin that way, you know, trying to look at other opportunities for Derry and to tackle regional inequality so that we can have that connectivity from the city to other issues or, or other areas and other regions. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, on the issue uh, of a uh, common framework, I I've been clear there should be no diminution or less lessening in terms of standards. Also very clear that we need to have full implementation of the protocol. My department is very committed to playing its part. I've also been um, clear in the executive that time is running out and we have a lack of clarity from um, the British government uh, on what is absolutely required. You, you know, you'll know from your, yourself from your engagement with businesses and the committee. It is a huge concern. They just don't know what they're meant to be planning for, and they're also trying to recover from COVID. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a, a double catastrophe in my view. And um, so we need to be doing what we can to support them. But it's very clear that we need to know exactly what we have to be implementing. Um, and I think, as an executive uh, as well, I know we've been very preoccupied with COVID, but I've been very keen that we have 
very, very regular and substantial meetings on Brexit. Um, and I think that we should be bringing that to the floor of this Assembly and to committees as well, so that committees individually are very aware of what ministers and departments are doing in terms of their role in the implementation of the protocol. Um, on phase three of the railway line, um, yes, uh, because that's 10 years old, the Department of Finance guidelines necessitates a new feasibility study, um, which is why I've taken um, this step, because I'm keen to see that commitment realised. Um, I've also cleared that the terms of reference need to have input from the local community and I've been engaging with Into the West and they have very kindly agreed to work in partnership in terms of the shaping of those terms of reference um, to get them right. You're also right in saying that there has been historic um, underinvestment in terms of uh, parts of Northern Ireland and parts of the island. There are parts of our island that remain unconnected and I think that there are huge opportunities for connectivity and rail um, and it was also part of our climate action, so I'm keen mm -hmm. to see that um, moved forward. Um, in terms of the wider issues around uh, connectivity between um, Derry and Donegal and Leonard Kenny, it's absolutely something that I want to discuss with counterparts in, in the south. Um, we have a huge number of cross-border workers in that region, uh, and I think they could hugely benefit from a greater public transport network. But I would caution that when we are pushing collectively to see an expansion of our infrastructure network when it comes to public transport, our buses and rails, when we're laying rail lines, which I would like us to be able to do, we have to make sure that we have a public transport network that can provide the trains and the buses to run along those new routes as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr Beggs. Again, thanks for coming along to the committee and uh, for your introductory remarks. I'd like to go back to Northern Ireland Water to start with, um, and then these, the, the hundred areas where there is inadequate wastewater treatment facilities, including the town of Larne, which is uh, inhibiting uh, development. Um, we've been told that this is uh, stopping some new social housing development. Uh, it's certainly, I'm aware of it, uh, preventing private sector housing development, potentially factories, offices. Uh, it, it is unacceptable to continue in this basis for, uh, for any longer. So uh, is there any sign the executive is going to provide the capital money? And if not, are you taking an options paper to the executive so that they can decide how else that this is going to be done? Because to, to recover from COVID, we do need proper infrastructure in place. Yeah, I mean, as you rightly point out, and the chair has as well, this is a huge issue. And it's often difficult to convey the seriousness of it um, uh, because it's very difficult to make it a motive because people take it so much for granted. But as you say, Mr Beggs, it's only when you realise that we can't build homes in that area, we can't build a factory to get people jobs, that we realise how critical the situation is when really a strategic approach would have ensured that we never reached that position in the first place. As I've said to the Chair, I've made the case on multiple occasions. I've circulated a number of executive papers. I'm preparing a refreshed uh, paper specific to Northern Ireland Water for submitting to the Finance Minister and to executive colleagues, grounding that in the COVID and wider economic recovery. In terms of an options paper on the way forward, um, I've been clear uh, that I don't believe or support the introduction of water charges. That is the position of the First um, and the Deputy First Minister as well. They stated those positions. So if that is all of our stated position as an executive, then we have to ensure that we are seeing critical investment in that public service. Um, and so, you know, that is the position of the executive. We can't run away from this investment. Um, it's critical. And so I would hope that with further engagement with executive colleagues, we would be in a position where we can see some of that investment coming forward. And I've tried to do what I can on the capital side in terms of my budget this year for Northern Ireland Water. But where I do fall down is in terms of revenue. That's a historical situation that I have inherited. But I do think that as well as the capital investment that I'm trying to bring forward within my year, my budget this year, as an executive in terms of kick-starting the economy. There are a number of, of infrastructure projects that are around water and wastewater that we could be advancing, and I would keen to, be keen to see that part as a wider, a wider recovery strategy as well. Can I just pick up a point uh, someone made earlier uh, in terms of uh, uh, an infrastructure investment commission or an independent body to give uh, good independent advice for long-term investment? I wouldn't get support for that. I think many other regions have that. Uh, and it will actually probably highlight the, 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 how critical it is to have this wastewater in place. Now, in terms of MOT centres, we had the problem of the ramps, which are 
and, and progress of being uh, uh, replaced, uh, like an update in that, we then have COVID, which is, will result in new working relations, uh, new working requirements for staff. Um, what capacity do we currently have in our MOT centres, and what is the long-term plan to ensure that we will be able to provide the necessary uh, testing? Okay. Okay, thank you. So, um, in terms of the, our MOT centres and the installation of lifts, new lifts have already been installed in Newry, Cookstown, Derry, Coleraine, Larne, Mollusk, Lisburn, Ballymena, Craigavon and Downpatrick. The remaining test centres at Enniskillen, Armagh and Oma will all have lifts installed by the end of July. My members will be aware that there are two MOT centres that are currently being used as COVID testing centres, that's Belfast and Newton Ards. Um, so we won't be installing lifts in those locations. I've said to the Health Minister that he and those in the front line can have those test centres for uh, as long as they need them and that will create displacement issues if they are required on a very long term basis but we will absolutely work around that. In terms of the capacity um, of our MOT centres, I mean, one of the frustrations that I have had is our inability to uh, have diesel emission testing and that's why in my budget allocation this year I have moved for the Hyde Bank project. Uh, so that's a capital project that would see a new build test centre there that would be able to facilitate these emission testings, which I think is very important in terms of climate action, in terms of providing that new facility. I'm also very mindful that there is needs for improvements around the digital aspect of DVA services. So we've made some inroads there, but I definitely think that there's more that can be done. And as part of my budget allocation as well, money has been set aside to have its transformation work that I frame it, but it's, it's about transformation for customers in terms of their engagement and their experiences of services with DVA. In, in terms of cars that have been sown by either individuals or dealers, what is the current lead time and how, how are we going to ensure that there's a, a very limited time? Because that's very significantly adversely affecting individuals and businesses. So what is the current lead time? So on the 20th of July, there will be the resumption of MOTs for priority vehicles. And by priority vehicles, I mean the vehicles that have been sorned for over one year, which means they couldn't avail of the TECs. By priority vehicles, I mean first time taxis as well. So from the 20th of July, they will be able to access MOTs and we're working very quickly through those priority vehicles. So if you have any constituents who are in that position, they should be able to get MOT tests very quickly come the 20th of July. In the test centres that we will have open, this would be aside from those that are being used as COVID testing centres. The test centres in England haven't shut at all, um, uh, so it seems strange that we're still having this big delay. I know we've had our problems, but what I'm asking is when can someone who's taken their car off the road for whatever personal reasons, when can they, what is the lead time that they come to you today? I want to get my car sewn or back on the road. I want, to, I want to get it MOT'd so I can get it taxed and get it back on the road. What is the current lead time? When will I be able to do it? Well, from the 20th of July, so in, I don't know what, this is the 7th. Oh, but that's, that's prioritised for... Yeah, but a sewn vehicle is a priority vehicle because if, you, okay. if your vehicle has been sorned for over a year, you can't avail of a temporary exemption certificate. If yeah. I've just taken my car off the road for the past 11 months or less, okay. I can get a temporary exemption certificate right, so okay. I can keep the vehicle on the road. That was one of the, the reasons for pursuing the temporary exemption certificates. It was about trying to minimise yeah. the disruption to motorists and allowing them to keep their vehicle on the road and get taxed. So they should not have noticed any disruption. Uh, and what we've done is we've worked a system now where if I got a TEC, um, on the 3rd of March, for example, this year, um, because my MOT was due then. The TEC process will mean that my car will be due for MOT on the 3rd of March 2021, bringing me up to an additional year. That is about minimising disruption to customers, but it's also about allowing us to manage the backlog, to ensure that we aren't just immediately moving into an MOT resumption situation where we have huge volumes of vehicles that need testing. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, at the outset, I would declare I was a previously an employee of TransLink and a member of Ards and North Down Borough Council. Just touching upon the issues around the Infrastructure Commission, um, the Department did not bid for any additional capital funding as part of the June monitoring round, as far as I understand it. Um, 
the Northern Ireland Executive through the Department of Finance can borrow up to two hundred million pounds a year for capital funding, and we're not borrowing anything around that. There's discussions today from the Finance Minister about transferring capital money to resource. So there's clearly a systemic issue here around being able to spend money on infrastructure projects and being able to get that capital funding out. Um, I would just really want to ask the Minister, what timescales are we thinking about in terms of trying to get an infrastructure commission or even just a panel set up to find a way to get these projects delivered? We've got a lot of schemes that are in development and all the rest of it, but they're not there being delivered. And what we need to be doing now as part of the recovery phase is about focusing on jobs, because infrastructure will create employment and will obviously improve our society. But how can we get the focus upon getting this moving? Because the progress to date has, has not been acceptable. Um, on the issue of not um, having an additional capital bid for June monitoring, um, that is a highly unusual situation for the Department for Infrastructure to be in. Um, but it was being um, honest in terms of the reflection of the impact of COVID. Um, but I have made it clear that I reserve the right to make an additional capital bid at the next uh, monitoring round um, because I'm keen to get um, money on the ground investment for the very reasons that you say in terms of kickstarting the construction sector, creating employment and just boosting economic growth. On the issue of borrowing, the Department for Infrastructure is not able to take a decision like that on its own in terms of borrowing or the transition of capital to revenue. Um, um, but I know that it's something that, as an executive, we're looking at, and the finance minister is leading on those discussions on behalf of the executive. Um, in terms of a timescale for the uh, formation of an independent advisory or infrastructure commission, um, what I'm doing is I'm engaging with stakeholders. Um, I want to give some consideration to it, not to elongate it, but just to make sure that I can get the right proposal, because I'm very conscious that this is not a matter that's within my gift. If we're serious about having a commission that is strategic and looks across the board at infrastructure projects, recognising the, the gambit and the scope of that, then it will require um, an executive decision in terms of taking it forward. I want to work up the idea, listen to the experts, take on board, taken on board very much and heartened by the support around the committee today for the idea. So be keen to work up a proposal and take it to executive colleagues. Thank you. Um, just following on around the whole issue about economic growth, um, the planning system has a real significant role to play in relation to that. And the review of the 2011 Planning Act um, was meant to commence a long time ago, but obviously we're, we didn't have any ministers in place. Um, there was one of the responses to one of my assembly questions about the idea of bringing the scope of the terms of reference for that to the committee. Um, obviously conscious that uh, in terms of the, 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 the weeks ahead, when about are we going to get an, an idea of terms of the scope of that review and get that going? Because the planning system and some of the delays around that isn't helping economic growth. Yeah, I, I agree that the planning system has a huge role to play. I also recognise that there is room for improvement uh, in, in a number of aspects of the operation of our planning system, not least when it comes to consultee response times. Um, and the department had established a forum. <coughs> to look at this issue to ensure that we can have greater efficiency in terms of consultation responses and I'm mindful that my own department you know, has significant improvements to make in that area and I don't shy away from making that point. In terms of the review of the Planning Act, you're absolutely right. Um, there is a statutory requirement and I am keen to take that forward. I am finalising the terms of references with officials and I would hope that the terms of reference could come before this committee um, very, very soon. Okay. I was very keen that that goes ahead and we get that, that yeah. proceeding. One other thing just around planning is that there's obviously a bill going through the Assembly at the moment in light of the Buick judgment, and that would obviously give the Minister power to take decisions on regionally significant applications. Yeah. Is there applications that you would be seeking to make a decision on in the month of August if that bill is passed uh, by the end of this month? And also around that, um, how do you feel around taking the decision in relation to the energy from waste plant and in terms of your own personal comments around that? Okay, so uh, as planning minister, I will always adhere robustly to all statutory processes. I take my role as a decision and an impartial decision maker very seriously in those matters. Uh, as you have said, yes, there is a, a bill working its way through the assembly under accelerated passage. Um, the Buick judgment um, could have been read. Um, as meaning that most planning decisions on applications that were before the department would have to be decided upon by the executive. So that would leave any infrastructure minister um, without the authority to take the planning decisions that are responsibility of their department. We discussed this extensively at the executive uh, and the legal remedy um, that was agreed upon is now working its way through the um, processes in the assembly up to uh, royal assent. 
Um, there are a number of strategic planning applications that my department uh, is working on um, at PACE. Um, it's a north-south interconnector, uh, casement, and so they're working to ensure that all of the statutory processes are completed so that they can get recommendations uh, to me. Uh, when recommendations come to me and it's established that I have the authority to take those decisions, um, then um, I absolutely will after all of the processes have been robustly completed. Just one last question. The Blue Green Fund was announced it was £20 million. Uh, what mixture of that is it capital and resource spending? And is there any scope to potentially increase that? Because whilst it's welcome, the £20 million, in comparison to the commitments that have been given, for example, by the Irish Government in terms of investment in public transport and active travel, it pales in insignificance. Yeah. I absolutely would have liked to have done more. Um, the difficulty is that you know, if I'm not given the money, I can't get spending it, and I also have the, the fiscal challenge of trying to spend in year and deliver in year uh, with single year budgets, and that's why I'd be very keen that we move as an executive to multi year budgets, not least because of the, the strategic infrastructure approach that we have discussed in terms of a, 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 an advisory group or a commission, but also it lends to better decision making. The £20 million pound that is there um, is capital, and I'm keen to look to see can I link in with other departments, say the Department for Communities and with councils to bring revenue to that as well. I'm also looking to see is there support in kind that I can give to some of these projects um, and if there's expertise as well that we can lend. So yes, at the minute it's, it's capital, um, keen to link in and untap uh, revenue resource as well from councils and from other government departments so that we're getting the maximum effect in terms of trying to build change. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And finally, Ms. Cummins. Okay, to squeeze in before Last the end probably. of the hour. <laughs> <laughs> I've only I've only a couple of questions anyway. Thanks, um, Minister, for for the update today. Um, I suppose leading on from uh, Mr. Moore's comments around the Blue Green Fund, I've had a couple of queries already, you know, from local community groups and that about how they can go about accessing it if that's how it's being rolled out. So, if we're able to elaborate a wee bit around that, will it be used for greenways, cycle lanes, that type of thing, and can it be? Um, initiatives that have been uh, put together by the by the community and how it's it, to be accessed. Two other things just and, and Mr Muir also talked about planning and I've said probably said all the time, but just again, I see now that England have ex have moved to extend planning permission in light of COVID. So I was just saying if there's any um, possibility that we can revisit this because I know that I'm still getting queries about it and it's I suppose the construction industry isn't fully back up and running and that, and that is causing um you know implications for people with planning uh, permission that's due to expire. And a number of weeks ago we had the Mineral Products Association in here too who also felt it would be beneficial to um, extend planning permission in light of COVID. And the last one just is around the um, the A1. And as you know, Minister, I've raised it quite a number of times. It's something I'm very uh, passionate about, and I think it's it's probably one of the most important projects um, that we are we have at present. Um, so it was just to say when the scheme will begin, and is the department exploring other ways to improve what I would say is one of the most dangerous roads on this island. Uh, thank, thank you very much. On the Green Blue Fund, yes, um, there are a number of projects that I've highlighted in terms of themes, so uh, cycle lanes, um, greenways, SUDs, so sustainable um, drainage systems. I think there's a number of pilots that we could look at with housing associations and with schools there. Um, so that's the themes, but what I'm very clear on is that it needs to come from the bottom up. So I'm keen that um, it is community-led. I think that probably the most appropriate vehicle is uh, through the councils, um, to work its, to work the proposal up and then obviously it would come up to my walking and cycling champion uh, and then to me as well. So I would encourage communities to come forward with ideas or councils to come forward with ideas and try to advance those proposals so that I can come in to support them financially uh, as well. On the issue of plan and permission extensions, yes, England has moved. Um, and that follows Scotland. I think that's a reflection of the fact that planning permissions are only valid for a three-year period in England and in Scotland, whereas in Wales and Northern Ireland, it's a five-year period. Uh, and Wales hasn't made this move to extend the planning permission period. Uh, it is something that I am keeping under review. I know that the construction sector um, was one of the first <laughs> to get back to work and safely. And the representations that I'm receiving as infrastructure minister, but also as a wider executive, is that the construction sector is keen to get as much work as possible on all possible scales, from the building of a bungalow right up to you know the building of a 
of, of a huge factory. So be keen to try to provide as much opportunity for the construction sector in that. But you know, if you are still um, getting representations that people can't get planning permissions commenced because they can't get access to um, construction workers, you know, it's something you know I would like to. I know you've been in correspondence with me. I look at and I, do, I am keeping the issue of um, primary legislative change on the table. But I just think as we work our way through this and we see more and more of the construction sector back and we're keen to get them work, that the the, the case for legislative change is not as strong now at this point in time in recovery as it would have been a while back. And thirdly, do you have a third? The A1. The A1. Yeah, so I'm very committed to the A1. As I've said before, I met with Mr and Mrs Hine on it um, and listened about their son, Carl, and I recognise that there's been a number of fatalities and, and injuries on that road. So it is a priority project for me, and I've given allocation in my budget specifically to the A1. I think that for road safety reasons, it's a priority. It's also a priority in terms of connectivity, given the strategic importance of that role. So, as I said to Mrs. Sahini and to her husband, um, I am committed to doing what I can to try to get this progress and to get work commenced on the A1 as soon as possible. Yeah, thank you. And just very quickly to come back in terms of the planning issue, it's more about those applications that um, fell during COVID when construction was down and obviously then they have to go through the process of renewal and all of that as well. So it was to try and um, to, uh, deal with that more so than not being able to get construction. Access. I know. And the chief planner has written to um, all of the councils to say that you know they need to be speedy and um, efficient in terms of renewals. And I do appreciate that it's not an optimum situation because even though the renewal application fee you know, is significantly reduced. It is still an additional cost. Yeah, and I suppose that, as well as that, there's also a risk that some of them will not be successful once through renewal. That, that for whatever reason, things may have changed in five years since they first got approval. So that's also been a concern. Um, that there's a risk that they'll fall again. You know, and then they're back to, to in the renewal one. process. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So okay, thank you. Thank you. It's maybe an issue that I could pick up as the chief planner to pick up with some of the councils on that particular issue around okay. that concern. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Anderson has indicated, and she's given me an assurance that it's a very short. <laughs> okay. And uh, I'm really not looking for you to provoke an answer today because I want you to think about it. I know Derry is not New York or Boston or Sydney, but we think we are. Of course. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and in that line, and uh, given because of pride not being able to take place this year and the day Derry Fela, I would just like you to go back and try and reconsider. Um, the opportunity on two of the separate curtains to paint them in the rainbow colours. So I'm trying not to provoke you to say no today. I know. That you will just go and reconsider it. I and have. That's I all have. I'm asking you to do um, yeah. at this meeting. No, and, and uh, you know, as I said in the AQ response, I actually think it's an excellent idea, and I did look into it. There, it's set out in legislation. As you take on this job, you realise that things that seem very small are set out very clearly in legislation. So the uh, layout of a zebra crossing, black and white stripes, is actually stipulated in the legislation, which is prohibiting me from being able to take that idea forward. But what I am keen to do is to support um, the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, and if we aren't able to celebrate Pride in the normal way, then I would be keen to look at creative ways that we could That's try why to celebrate it. That that was fair. And it was a good idea. It's just, unfortunately, it's well, prescribed in legislation. Well, we can see maybe if we could. Okay. <laughs> an opportunity. Thank you. Well, in terms of time, and we didn't, we weren't too bad actually if we within our time. But thank you very much, um, both the Minister and Permanent Secretary, for coming this morning. I continue to be concerned in relation to Northern Ireland Water and, and appreciate that you'll be getting further information. And I, I think the committee would welcome you sharing that if there were issues sort of during the, the summer recess um, with us and that we can turn to this as a, as a as Thank a you. And, and Chair, can I just say as well, you know, um, you know, you put it aptly yesterday when you said it's about support and challenge, and I think that's very important um, part of the process. And I do want to thank the committee because, you know, as a result of this crisis, things have been brought to you at very short notice. I think yesterday of the LCM, and the committee has always, you know, facilitated that and, and worked very cooperatively on that. And I even understand, you know, today there are a number of SL ones that are being brought before you. And I just want to say thank you for the urgent consideration that you do give all of these matters. It's it's greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members, we're going to move through um, a number of items.
fairly quickly. We've got quite a lot to do, um, and we might we will have to take a couple of minutes break for a changeover um, after the next three items, and to allow for a wipe down of the top right. table. So, if you bear with me, we'll do items six, seven, and eight before we do that. Um, just to note that the three statutory rules contained in your pack this week have been replaced due to a drafting error, and these are all available in your table papers. So moving then to item six, um, these are the SRs, which are not subject to assembly proceedings. At page 27 and tabled at page four is SR 2020-131, that's the drought Altna Hinch impounding reservoir order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 1st of July 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Great. Great. Thank you. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-131, the drought Altna Hinch, impounding reservoir order Northern Ireland 2020 and has no objection to the rule. At page 31 and tabled at page 9 is SR 2020-132. The Drought Black Springs Emergency Obstruction Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 1st of July 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this Great. rule? Great. Thank you. But the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-132, the Drought Black Springs Emergency Abstraction Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. At page 35 and tabled at page 14, SR 2020-133, the Drought Spelga Impounding Reservoir Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on 1 July 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Great. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-133, the drought, Spelga impounding reservoir order, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Great. Great. The next two pieces of subordinate legislation are linked and therefore they have been submitted to the committee on a single SL1. However, as procedures dictate, as they are of an assembly resolution, they must be listed separately on the agenda. I propose to read the purpose of the legislation together for members to agree. Um, item 7, SL1, the Motor Vehicle Testing Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. It's at page um, 40, the, it's Motor Testing uh, Vehicle Testing Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and uh, tabled at page 20 from the Department of Infrastructure is the exemption from periodic roadworthiness testing for vehicles of historical interest regulatory impact assessment. Um, and item 8 is SL1, the Goods Vehicles Testing Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. You find at page 20, the good ve Goods Vehicles Testing Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. The statutory rules are subject to negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. Currently in Northern Ireland, motorcycles, motor cars and light goods vehicles manufactured or registered before 1960 are exempt from the mandatory roadworthiness MOT test. In GB, following consultation, a 40-year exemption on a rolling basis was proposed and came into force on the 20th of May 2018. This change in GB has therefore created disparity between the MOT testing regime in GB and that which is in place in Northern Ireland. The department has been lobbied extensively by elected representatives and the public on this issue over recent months to alleviate the pressure on MOT testing at DVA test centres. This has been particularly highlighted in relation to the situation in MOT centres with vehicle testing backlogs. In addition, in GB, some vehicles, including vehicles of historic interests, are exempt from paying road tax, and this could provide Northern Ireland with the same opportunity. Vehicle excess duty and road tax is an, an accepted matter and is managed by DVLA Swansea. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rules? Great. Mm -hmm. I think we're probably more than content. We're very, very <laughs> yeah, happy with that. And job and really. Many <laughs> happy constituents in relation to that. Um, if members are content, we'll take a short pause um, for cleaning the top table. Thank you. Is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed?
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This Okay, can I welcome uh, Stephen Hughes, Diedrich Gallagher, Trevor McClay and Brian McCarran um, through the next number of items in relation to um, SL1s. Um, you may not be required, but just given the arrangements that we currently have in place, it was it was better to have you in, in situ rather than coming in back and forward. So, um, thank you. Moving then to item 13, which is SL1, the Whitless Street Belfast Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, tabled at page 57, the Whitless Street um, Belfast Abandonment Order. The statutory rule is subject to negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of 608 square metres of former road within the boundaries of a car park at Whitless Street, Belfast, comprising planted area and car park bounded on the north by Whitless Street, to the east by York Gate Railway Station car park and to the west by York Street. The abandonment has been requested by Belfast City Council as the owner of the car park um, to enable it to tidy up its title to the car park and to assume responsibility for maintenance. The Department is of the view that the road is not necessary and may be abandoned. Following the abandonment, responsibility for the area of former road will revert to Belfast City Council as the landowner. Are members content with the proposal for the statutory rule or do you have any questions or queries in relation to it? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, thank you. SL1. Item 14, SL1, the Railway Avenue Newry Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The statutory rule is subject to negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of 40 square metres of road commencing at the junction of Railway Avenue and Monaghan Street, Newry, and extending for a distance of 13.5 metres in a northerly 
the erection. The abandonment has been requested by the registered owner of the bed and soil of the area of road in question to facilitate a proposed planning application for a commercial unit. Following the abandonment, the land will revert to the registered owner. Do members have any queries, or are you content with the Indeed. proposal? Yeah. Content. Thank you. Item 15, SL1, the Omer Road Belfast Footway Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland, 2020. And you'll find that tabled at page 66. The statutory rule is subject to negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of 3.3 square metres of footway adjacent to the Arigal Inn on the Omer Road in Belfast. As the department is the owner of the bed and soil under the area of road in question, an abandonment is required in order for the land to be disposed of. Following the abandonment, the bed and soil of the area of road to be, to be abandoned will be disposed of in accordance with the statutory procedures laid down for the disposal of, disposal of government-owned land, and it is proposed to dispose of the land to the owners of the Arigal Inn. Are members content with the proposal Please. for the statutory rule? No issues. And thank you. SL1, the Motorways Traffic Amendment Number 2 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, tabled at page 71. The statutory rule is subject to negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. The rule will amend Regulation 14D of the Motorways Regulations, which currently provides an exception from the Motorways Regulation for a person using a motorway in contravention of those regulations where he does so in the exercise of his duty as a constable or as a member of a fire brigade or ambulance service. The current exception in Regulation 14D does not provide for PSNI civilian staff to uh, provide tactical pursuit training. The proposed amendment will amend Regulation 14D to extend this exemption to PSNI civilian staff authorised by the Chief Constable to provide specialist driver training to PSNI officers on motorways. The proposed amendment has been requested by the PSNI to allow PSNI civilian staff, again authorised by the Chief Constable, to provide specialist driver training, including police tactical pursuit training, which involves high-speed driving on motorways to PSNI officers. The use of civilian instructors to deliver driving training on motorways is commonplace elsewhere in the United Kingdom. Do members have any queries, or are you content with the proposal for the statutory rule? Great. Content. Thank you. Yeah. Item 17, SL1, the footpath to the rear of Albert Street, Quadrant Place and Culling Tree Road, Belfast, Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, can be found at Table Papers, page 75. The statutory rule is subject to negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of 307.9 square metres of footpath on the western side of the West Link to the rear of Albert Street, Quadrant Place and Culling Tree Road, extending from its junction with Albert Street northwards for a distance of 115 metres to the south side of the West Link footbridge between Durham Street and Culling Tree Road. The bed and soil of the area of road in question is partly owned by the Northern Ireland Housing Executive and partly owned by the Department for Infrastructure. Following the coming into operation of the abandonment order, the bed and soil of the area of road owned by the Department will be declared surplus and disposed of in accordance with the statutory procedures laid down for the disposal of the government-owned land and transferred to Belfast City Council. Are members content with the proposal for the statutory rule? Okay. Item 18, SL1, the back street at Duncairn Gardens, Belfast Development Order, Northern Ireland 2020. You'll find this tabled at page 80. The statutory rule is subject to negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of 57.8 square metres of road comprising former back street commencing at the southeast corner of the boundary of Duncairn Gardens, Belfast, and extending for a distance of 34 metres in a southeasterly direction along the northern boundary of number 13, Portfield Place, to its eastern boundary with number 31, Meadow Place. Following the abandonment, the area will revert to the landowners who will take on responsibility for the maintenance of the new structure. Are members content? Item 19, SL1, the A29 New Road and B30 Newry Road, Silverbridge Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. It's 
find tabled at page 85. The statutory rule is subject to negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of 3,599 square metres of former road at the junction of New Road and Newry Road, Silverbridge. It is proposed that when the abandonment order comes into operation, departmental solicitors will be instructed to remove the department's burden on the area in question. Are members content with the proposal? Great. Thank you. Item 20, uh, subordinate legislation SL1s not subject to assembly proceedings, tabled at page 90. The parking places on roads and waiting restrictions, Newry Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. This rule is not subject to any assembly procedure and is not required to be led. The rule will prohibit vehicles waiting at any time, loading and unloading permitted on lengths of Flagstaff Road, Newry. Vehicles are accepted from the um, prohibition in certain circumstances. The proposals are being introduced with the intention of preventing all-day parking and improving, improving the free flow of um, traffic, uh, particularly in the vicinity of the ambulance station. Members content with the proposal for the statutory rule? Really? Thank you. Tabled at page 92, the parking places on roads and waiting restrictions, Macrofelt Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. This rule is not subject to any assembly procedure and is not required to be led. The rule amends parking and waiting restrictions in Macrofelt. Vehicles are accepted from the conditions of the parking places in certain circumstances. The amendment to the existing parking place on King Street and the authorisation of the new parking place on Church Street are necessary to match the provisions on the ground and to allow enforcement. The amendments to Rainy Street will allow the reinstatement of a disabled bay. Are members content? Good. Good. Thank you much. Tabled at page 95, the parking places, loading bay and waiting restrictions, Port Stewart Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. This rule is not subject to any assembly procedure and is not required to be led. The rule will reduce the length of an existing limited waiting parking place and introduce a parking place with unlimited waiting for disabled persons vehicles only on a length of the Diamond Service Road in Port Stewart. Vehicles are accepted from the um, prohibitions in certain circumstances. The proposal will assist holders of a blue badge to park closer to the post office and to shops. Are members content with the proposal for the statutory rule? Great. Great. Tabled at page 97, the parking and waiting restrictions, Newtonards Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. This rule is not subject to any assembly procedures and is not required to be led. The rule will prohibit vehicles waiting at any time on lengths of Portaferry Road, Newtonards, located at a new uncontrolled crossing location. Vehicles are accepted from the um, provisions in certain circumstances. Um, this being introduced in the interest of road safety and traffic progression in the area. Are members content with the proposed statutory agreed? And I'm very, I'm welcoming <laughs> it. Thank you. Um, tabled at page 99, the waiting. Parking and waiting restrictions, Newton Abbey Order, Northern Ireland 2020. This rule is not subject to any assembly procedure and is not required to be led. The rule outlines new restricted waiting times for vehicles and roads outlined at page 99 of the table papers. Vehicles are accepted from the restrictions in certain circumstances. The waiting restrictions are being introduced to alleviate parking issues at these locations. The rule will also revoke and reenact certain existing parking places and waiting restrictions in Jordanstown, Malask, Newton Abbey and White Abbey to consolidate them into one order for the area. Are members content with the proposal for the statutory rule? Great. Great. Well done. Thank you. Tabled at page 101, the parking and waiting restrictions, Kilkeel Order, Northern Ireland 2020. This rule is not subject to any assembly procedure and is not required to be led. The rule will prohibit vehicles waiting at any time on a length of Rooney Road, Kilkeel. Vehicles are accepted from the um, restrictions in certain circumstances, the restrictions being introduced with the um, intention of preventing all day parking and improve the free flow of um, traffic, particularly in the vicinity of the ambulance station. The rule will also revoke and re-enact certain existing parking and waiting restrictions in Kilkeel to consolidate them into one order. Are members content with the proposal for the statutory rule? Great. Thank you. And that we have tabled at page 103, the waiting 
parking and waiting restrictions Bally Clare Amendment Order in Northern Ireland 2020. This rule is not subject to any assembly procedure and is not required to be led. The rule will um, be amending the descriptions of certain parking places on lengths of George Avenue, Rashi Road and the Square Bally Clare. Are members content with the proposal for the statutory rule? Finally, tabled at page 105, the road speed limit order in Northern Ireland uh, 2020. The rule is not subject to any assembly procedure and is not required to be led. The rule will apply and revoke speed limits to a range of roads outlined at page 105 of the table papers. Are members content? Could, sorry, to... sorry, can I just break the, <laughs> the flow here <laughs> and ask on, on page 105... You have included parts of Derry Trasna Road and Loch Brickland and Uri. Just can you um, are you telling us that there's a, because the street lights there's normally a thirty mile limit on those roads and they're going to then apply it to a forty mile um, on those roads to or de restricted? Yeah, it's just chair. I have a problem where there, it, it doesn't seem to be widely known by people uh, that where there are street lights. It is actually a 30 mile per hour speed limit unless there is a uh, it's been revoked by road service and that has caused a few problems in some areas. I think um, whoever is dealing with that isn't actually here today, but I do I do think it is an issue of actually trying to rectify the position on the ground uh, right. in relation to that particular ASL one. Would you like to with that? Uh, but we'll proceed with it, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I was just trying to clarify there. It's a play, I think they're reducing the speed limit, if I read that correctly. The, um, some parts will go to a 40 mile limit but uh, and then apply a 30 mile limit and part of Lisburn revoke a number of speed, so 30 mile restricted by street lighting. The uh, Lock it's just I had been contacted by someone before in the Lock Brickland area who has a visual impairment, you know, and trying to cross the road at the post office. And there's not enough traffic that warrants um, traffic um, uh, crossing, pedestrian crossing. So I just would, uh, uh, if it's the case uh, as it reads here, and if other members can see that, it seems that the 30 hour limit will apply. Would that be right? I, I think it's, um, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't have the, the yeah. detail of it, but I think it is, um, it will apply to part of the road and yeah. then um, the rest of the road is to try and rectify the position of the ground. But yeah. if you like, I can ask the official team that maybe to. Yeah, it might be useful. I'm just particularly interested in the Loch Brickland and Derry Trasten area because Derry Trasten is about nine speed bumps on a very small stretch of the road and the people are giving off stink about it. But uh, if I could just get a clarification, if it's, if it's a reduction, I certainly welcome it. I'm, not st you know, I'm happy right, so enough you, for it to proceed. Okay, so we can have this proposal wanted. and um, it'd be great, we'd be grateful to get yeah. more information. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. okay. We are approving it. We're approving it, but we're going to get further information just for. Right. Yes, no, that's all. Right. I just wanted to. The arm all road news, all right, Lord. Okay. Um, okay. Um, we're content, Chair. Thank you very much, um, and, and thank you for your, for your time. Um, obviously, we, we we didn't need a great deal of input, but thank you very much for making yourselves thank available. You. No problems. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Moving then back to item nine in your parts, which is our correspondence. Eric, can I just raise a point? And, um, it was just for Cathy, if you could look at. We were able to deal with it last night, and I was up to midnight just going through all of that. But it had to be sent to me um, because it didn't. It didn't. It wasn't in my inbox, so the table papers didn't arrive. That's and I've double checked happened. and double checked uh -huh. again just to see, but they're not here. Uh, the ordinary papers packed it, but the table papers didn't. It wasn't a problem. I had no issue with it um, because we were able to go through them before the meeting. But it's just up to when you're talking about it to have it in front of you. Okay. Sorry. What was it? Just in relation to table papers, some members were able to get it on their systems, and some others weren't. And because the table papers came quite late mm -hmm. in the day, there, as well. I, I just wanted to. Do it. Okay, so moving then to item nine, which is our correspondence, um, just draw your attention to the um, memo okay, at page 55. You'll see the memo, um, which lists all the correspondence and, office, and also the suggested action, um, if members have anything they wish to raise. Um, I had noticed a couple of things just in relation to um, we correspondence from Nilga. Um, 9.15 and also from the um, the minister and it was just in relation to the issue around the quarry enforcement 
and the issue around the uh, minerals um, forum. And as it turns out, there is the Department of the Economy um, has a regional minerals working group, um, which hasn't met for some time. So I really just, and also then the, the minister, the infrastructure minister had mentioned that while DFI hadn't considered or explored um, establishing a Northern Ireland minerals forum, she had suggested perhaps checking with DFE. Um, who could look at that with the support of the Geological Survey, Northern Ireland and Planning Authorities. So with mem if members are content that we may be right to the Minister for the Economy, mm -hmm. just exploring those two issues as to you know, okay. some progress in relation to the working for group and whether consideration had been given to a Northern Ireland Minerals Forum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Have members, any other consider things to consider coming out of correspondence? Um, on page 134, which is a correspondence dealing with the Brexit brief, uh, the papers uh, say that uh, the committee um, that the department um, has stated that COVID-19 has slowed down the department's work on, on the Brexit issue. And I think it would be good to get maybe some more details when we return. I know it's the clock's ticking and everybody mm. is aware that particularly after dealing with the port operators last week, that they feel unprepared, uninformed, and they, they lack understanding. And I think these papers have shown that there has not been able to, the department hasn't been able to take forward the work on Brexit uh, that it, uh, it, needed to, it needed to do. And I think the common framework and those things that I outlined as things that we would be, uh, we would be, we would benefit from becoming familiar with and understand them, and understanding the impact that they have on the department and the people related to them. I think this was we're mindful of the fact that COVID nineteen has had an impact on on everything, but obviously the Brexit issues is 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 a time Not critical. Away. So we'll return to that. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Moving then to the forward work program at page one hundred and seventy seven. And you'll see um, that we're scheduled to meet again then on the 9th of September. That's all dependent, of course, in case there's something urgent comes up um, mm. during recess that we may need to, to reconvene. But um, we're, we're focusing on the, on the 9th okay, of what September. Was that there, I see I some curious... flew over the head into the different room there. What was that? Curious, ex yeah. ex okay, curious no, I mean. expressions. But um, we're scheduling for the 9th of September. Um, if members have any comments in relation to that, uh, Mr. Muir. Yeah, so I uh, raised this in the questions to the Minister about the review of the 2011 Planning Act, and the Minister said that she was planning to bring the terms of that review uh, to the committee before recess. Um, obviously, the, the sooner that review can proceed, the better. And if the, you know, the Minister was wishing to proceed with that and had terms of reference to that, I wouldn't want the situation that we're in recess to hold that up. Mm. Um, so, because it's really important, the, the planning system, the economic recovery is really mm. important, and the planning system will play a role in that. So, I don't know how we fit in with regards to. Well, if members, if members are content that we write to the minister just on the back of her presentation today, yeah. um, and just yeah. to, yeah. see if we can get yeah. some time yeah. scales um, with regards to that. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it would be very important. Chair, well, okay. I did want to take up more time, but uh, I don't know if I recall Miss Kimmins' particular. Uh, difficulty around some of the planning approvals, but I have found in dealing with different councils, different interpretations sometimes of when work on site has been started, and therefore the conditions of the plan and approval have been met. Yeah. You know, we, I don't know if there's any advice in relation to constituents. You know, some planning departments say you actually have to put the fines in, mm -hmm. and other tells me if you clear the site and put a fence yeah, around yeah. it, yeah. that's it started. <laughs> Okay. And that holds the plan of approval mm. yes. for the applicants. So I think uh, that's yeah. what I would. Yes, there is an inconsistency. Yeah, so I just wonder, mm -hmm. you know, absolutely there might be something. Because yeah. I wouldn't want people falling foul of relying on one planning experience and then a different council area. What, what would it be possible? Content that we write, um, exploring that yes. again, yeah. and also yeah. Yeah. that would help clarification. Yeah. 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 Thank you. That's well, course action. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So members content them with forward work program at this stage. Obviously, we'll be in in touch um, if there's anything arises. Okay. If, if there is an emergency meeting call during the summer, you will have staff provided by the CAMS office, the central. Um, member support office. It will not necessarily be the staff of this committee. I'm off all summer. Ali Ross is off all summer. 
Johnny and Vincent are taking lead in the summer, so I will not be the clerk, and neither will Ali Ross if you have an emergency meeting. But they have they have insisted that they will provide a clerking a clerking team for you if there is a meeting. Okay. So okay. we'll just have to make the best chair of okay, the we'll, show, we'll, 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 we'll of take the that into consideration yeah. just as we as we go through the next number of weeks. Okay, okay so Mr. Muir. Just one other thing. At the last meeting, I'm trying to remember if it was the last meeting, the one before, but uh, we talked about a mini inquiry in September and we were asked to send three sort of ideas around that. I didn't do that, so apologies. I just know whether that's something we're going to consider as part of the way day in September. Well, I think or? that's something that we'll okay. consider and we'll, we'll, send out in, we'll send out a request in advance of that for, right, for further information right. and um, some consideration to that. Yep. Can I just raise one issue? As someone who lives beside the fishermen of the Loch Ness, <laughs> eel fishermen. Um, the, the lock is uh, very low and for some fishermen uh, they can't get out to their boats and some of them supplement um, the search and rescue. You know, Loch Ness, God forbid, there should be a problem. But as someone who lives along the lock shore, there's been a huge increase in use from other people coming out to Keys and things that they don't know. And they don't know, you know, we lost a friend many years ago uh, on in seven foot of water, you know, near the lock shore. So, um, I'm very mindful of, of, of um, the dangers and risks of Loch Ness in particular. But in, in the ni late 1950s, some of the keys that were identified as um, continuing to be the responsibility of, of Rivers Agency, where they would have dredged them, um, some of those are because of maybe handover and legacy issues, you know, that some fisher, fisher families are not able to use them. But the vast, you know, if other keys, and I've had site meetings with rivers agents on all the rest of it, but they're very loath to take on additional keys, and I can understand that. But So I would welcome if we could get the list that they're currently maintaining, you know, how often they actually desilt them or dredge them, you know, and... Um, if there's an opportunity, I have written to the minister recently on it. But if there's an opportunity to um, to swap some of the keys, you know, so if you're not operating, if you're not cleaning out key 53, but you can clean out key 55 because that's the one the fisherman now uses, that would be very helpful. And could I, uh, maybe you might know in your previous life, uh, um, whether or not um, the you know the equipment on the dredging. It, does that all belong to Rivers Agency and are their staff, you know, equipped to do it, or is that something that has to be contracted in? It's just in terms of the arguments. You know, if you already have a resource, uh, as opposed to having to have additional funding, we need to get some clarification. Yeah, I mean, I think it'd be very useful. It, it, it is historically low levels of Loch Ness, you know, and uh, Tomb Cooperative and all the rest are very concerned, you know, about just getting out. And it is, after all, the eel market is an export market. And uh, Holland and all the rest are starting to take the eels in. The eel fishing started on the 1st of July again, and they don't didn't want to lose that export business, so they're trying to get out again rather than stay under furlough. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I just think that sometimes we lose some. You know, this is an old old uh, family industry around Loch Ness that we'd want to see uh, continue into the future and be uh, protected for future generations as well. Okay. Members so, content that we read. Okay, yeah, thank you. Absolutely. There's also um, just in the, in the discussion with the minister around road safety. Um, Ms. Kelly mentioned presentations she received from the PSNI in relation to road safety, yeah. and I was just curious whether members would be content, perhaps, to look for a briefing for ourselves. From I, the I would recommend it. It might be yeah. very useful. Mm -hmm. It was um, is now acting SEC, but Sam Don uh, Donaldson. Did the presentation and it is an excellent presentation. Yeah. I would strongly recommend it. Just given the interest in, in the yep. room. Enough, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That's all very useful. Um, just before we leave, can I just advise you to maintain your social distancing, take all your papers with you, and uh, water bottles and glasses. Um, can I again thank members for um, for coming to the committee um, during this period? I think it's been really helpful to have have you all in the room and to have a conversation. And I also. Your attendance has been super, really, since we since we came back um, to business. So thank you very much for that, uh, and can I wish you all a, a very happy recess? So um, thank you. you. The, the next meeting of the committee is scheduled to take place on the 16th of September in the Senate Chamber at 10 a.m. With the strategy planning day taking place on the 9th of September. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sign.